So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Kun Yang from, uh, from MATLAB and Florida State University. Uh, Kun um, got his PhD from Indiana, and then he did postdoc at uh, Princeton and Caltech, I believe, and then uh, became a faculty in Florida. He's has worked on many interesting problems in condensed matter physics, including quantum hole effect, uh, superconductivity, magnetism, and the other things. But today he's going to tell us about entanglement and thermalization in the interacting fermionic system. Uh, thanks a lot, Song, for the kind of uh, invitation. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here to deliver this. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this uh, uh, cutoff of uh, uh, wait, why it's not doing? Okay, somehow I'm having difficulty turning it to slideshow. Yeah, you try clicking the thing at the bottom. Yeah, it was fine uh, until I clicked. I got it because I guess it started recording. So ah, well, it's showing doing. Yeah, okay, good, good, yeah. Yeah, it's a great honor to be here to actually give this uh, Karanov uh, uh, seminar, uh, who of course is a great hero of mine. In some sense, the topic of uh, uh, the talk is uh, kind of fitting because it touches upon uh, some foundational uh, issues of statistical mechanics, uh, as we're going to see. So uh, the main results I'm going to report are mainly obtained by two excellent postdocs, uh, Xinhua Lai, who was with us for uh, a few years uh, but left uh, uh, for other uh, endeavors uh, uh, many years ago now, and Ken Ma is actually a current postdoc. I'll also report some uh, uh, earlier work done in collaboration with a former student of mine, Wen Xin Ding, who is on the faculty now at Anhui University uh, in, in China. So the question that I will try to address a little bit is, can you actually do statistical mechanics or can statistical mechanics emerge from a single state instead of an ensemble, which of course is the usual starting point of a stat Mac, if you, for example, read the Kalanov's book, textbook on statistical physics. And I'm going to further actually simplify the problem by focusing on a single eigenstate to take a time evolution out of the picture. And the answer is believed to be yes if ETH holds. ETH stands for eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which actually has a variety of uh, closely related but not identical definitions in the literature. So the uh, uh, definition that I'm going to use for this talk is um, if you have a subsystem of uh, a whole system that is in eigenstate, and if the subsystem uh, has a reduced density matrix that is thermal, then I would say that uh, ETH holds. So um, I'll try to give partial answers to this question. Uh, so the first uh, set of results which addresses this is we're going to show that actually if you start from a highly uh, trivial, totally trivial, seemingly trivial system of free fermions, already the vast majority of eigenstates satisfy this property. Uh, in particular, uh, a consequence of that is the, uh, in, uh, the entropy of the subsystem is exactly the same as the uh, uh, entanglement entropy. So entanglement plays a huge role in uh, eigenstate summarization. Um, of course, being a trivial and totally integrable system, that's not the whole thing. And we do have, even though rare, but very well defined and highly uh, classifiable, uh, so the so-called atypical states that actually do not satisfy this property. And then we will try to um, try to uh, 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 make this uh, situation more realistic by turning on some weak interactions. And without uh, integrability, we're going to argue that in this case, uh, you actually do eliminate these outliers or atypical states, uh, also known as scar states. And uh, the probability of finding such state actually vanishes very, very fast as you go to um, a large system size. And I'm, I'm going to quantify that statement. So, um, so to begin though, I will actually give a very quick review of entanglement and it, uh, including the uh, uh, area law uh, satisfied by the ground states and uh, some of its important corrections. But of, of course, all the laws are designed to be violated and there are actually also well understood 
um, violations of, uh, 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 of this ground state area law uh, in system with the Fermi or perhaps the less familiar so-called both surfaces. And uh, we actually find some uh, uh, useful uh, uh, applications of this uh, area law violation. And then I'm going to uh, get on to the uh, main results that I outlined in the previous slide. First, to show that actually for the highly excited free fermion uh, states, you actually have volume law. And the volume law is actually related to the area law by a, uh, um, by a, uh, uh, a novel duality. And uh, uh, at least for typical states, and we came up with a term, uh, eigenstate typicality, to uh, uh, describe the situation. And uh, uh, finally, get to the uh, second uh, main result, which is these atypical states are actually eliminated by weak interactions. And this uh, realizes uh, the so called strong version of EKH, namely, there aren't any uh, outliers. So let's uh, start from the very beginning this EPR paper, uh, which, of course, started the business of, uh, of uh, uh, entanglement. Uh, of course, uh, after this year's Nobel Prize, uh, it doesn't need any introduction anymore. But I did learn something quite useful for me uh, by getting up early to watch the announcement, which is Schrodinger actually later in that year gave an affirmative uh, answer to the question posted in the title of the EPR paper, uh, in which he said that entanglement is not one, but the characteristic of quantum mechanics. Um, so I guess uh, the term entanglement was uh, introduced by Schrodinger in that paper. And I heard in a separate paper on the same year, he also introduced the most famous cat uh, in, the, in the entire world. Okay, so how do you actually detect Yeah, was there a question? No, okay. <laughs> Wasn't meant to be a joke, but. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the thing I like uh, the real audience uh, uh, talk instead of Zoom talk, because I'm very nervous to give jokes. <laughs> in a Zoom talk, because you, you feel totally embarrassed when there is no, no response from the audience. Anyway, um, but I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so um, the way to actually detect the presence of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 entanglement is to, well, starting from the uh, simplest example, a bell state with two spins. Uh, in a pure, uh, uh, it's a two spin system in a pure state, but Alice and Bob only individually has, uh, has access to one degree of freedom, but not the other. And for Alice, uh, if he actually look at the, let's say the, the left spin, it is actually in a, a mixed state. And you can quantify the amount of uh, uh, entanglement between the two spins by calculating the entanglement entropy, which in this case happens to be log two. Now, of course, in condensed matter, we are not uh, particularly interested in entanglement between uh, finite number of degrees of freedom, we are interested in uh, entanglement in system with many degrees of freedom. So here, the most uh, uh, important uh, uh, result is uh, area law satisfied by ground states, and that can be even proved uh, rigorously in some settings, which says that if you have a, a, a extensive system, and if you look at the entanglement, let's say between A and B, then the entanglement entropy scales as the area separating these two systems. Now, uh, of course, um, the uh, uh, area law has a coefficient that's non-universal. And in particular, uh, in a field theory where you have infinitely many degrees of freedom, uh, this uh, uh, area coefficient uh, usually actually diverges. So as a result, to use this area law-like uh, behavior to characterize phases in condensed matter, uh, we actually uh, look for um, look for uh, corrections, subjecting corrections to the area law. Here, the most important result is that from uh, Kitaya, Fresco, and Levin and Wen, which uh, uh, showed that uh, the uh, in the topological phase, uh, this uh, subleading correction is actually universal. It actually measures uh, the total quantum dimension of the topological phase. So I first uh, heard about this result when uh, Mike gave a uh, talk in the fall of uh, 2005 at Harvard. I think that was your uh, junior fellow interview talk. I was in the audience because, uh, because uh, I happened to be on sabbatical there. It was a super impressive talk. But the thing that impressed me most was a remark that uh, Mike uh, gave at the very beginning, which I don't know if you still remember. He said that usually he beats Kitaev in publishing an important result. 
But that's a rare exception. <laughs> so so that, that, that was super, super impressive for me. And we're going to actually hear a lot about rare exceptions in this talk, but, but not, not quite as significant as that one. Anyway, so this actually inspired me, as a matter of fact, to look for uh, uh, subleading corrections to uh, in some other uh, system like those with conventional orders. So I think uh, we were among the first to point out that if you have, let's say, a spontaneous break, a symmetry breaking, <coughs> excuse me, like a nail order, you actually get a subleading correction that could be uh, logarithmically divergent. Now it's still subleading to the area law, but it's actually not a number, but it's actually a, a growing uh, correction and. Uh, um, uh, stronger results uh, were obtained by uh, these authors who actually uh, found that there is a universal coefficient of that log associated with the number of uh, Goldstone uh, modes associated with the symmetry breaking. But these are still subleading uh, corrections. Uh, what about uh, violations? Well, it turns out violation of this area law is very common in one dimension, uh, usually in a logarithmic fashion. And here, the strongest result is when you have a conformal uh, critical point, uh, the uh, uh, coefficient of this log violation is universal uh, related to the uh, central charge. Uh, well, turns out a similar logarithmic violations uh, were also, are also present in non-conformal uh, critical points, uh, including, for example, random singlet like uh, 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 critical points in uh, disorder systems. Um, on the other hand, beyond one dimension, such violations are actually much rarer uh, until, well, probably not known to most of you, until a, a, a result beyond that I'm going to uh, flash later on, the only known result was actually for uh, free fermions with uh, Fermi surfaces. So this was actually also something I learned uh, also during uh, my sabbatical, uh, the same sabbatical actually uh, from, from other people. So turns out when you have a Fermi surface, you also have a uh, you also have a uh, logarithmic violation to the area. Now, of course, if you apply this to one d, d is equal to one, so that actually uh, uh, reduces to the to the same law. So, in particular, you can even uh, uh, calculate while well, using some mathematical conjecture, which might have been proven actually since then, uh, for this area law uh, coefficient. So, this is uh, uh, the result of Georg and Klitsch. Well, who showed that the uh, area law coefficient can be written as a convolution of the Fermi surface, which is a surface in momentum space, and the area uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the real space where you divide the system into two. So my first attempt to actually learn something uh, about uh, entanglement is try to understand the connection between this uh, uh, higher dimensional log violation and the one dimensional a lot. So uh, to understand that, the easiest thing to do is to actually first set up a fake high dimensional system, which is just a, a, a collection of parallel wires. So these are really one dimensional system, but then you artificially divide them up in a, for example, two dimensional way, and you ask what would be the coefficient of the log, co uh, of, of the log violation? Well, it's very simple. You just need to, well, let's say, look at the convex case, which is a little bit simpler. Uh, how many intersections your, uh, your uh, subsystem A has with these wires. And that will give you the log coefficient. Now, because this is really a, 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 a decoupled 1D system, uh, for free fermions, you actually have a flat Fermi surface. And the size of the Fermi surface along, let's say, the y direction is actually inversely proportional to the uh, separation between the wire. So it turns out this simple counting can actually precisely be written in this form that's uh, written down by, um, by uh, Geoff and Critch. So it actually works. But this actually turns out to be a starting point, at least to give a heuristic understanding of the uh, ge uh, genuine, let's say, two or higher dimensional system. So in a general two or higher dimensional system, you have, for example, a circular, it doesn't have to be, but let's just say, assume that we have a circular Fermi surface. So what you can do is you try to relate that to a collection of 1D system by dividing the Fermi surface into many, many small patches and the neglect within each patch is curvature. So then you flatten each patch, so it has a flat Fermi surface, kind of like this fake 
high dimensional system. Okay, but then you treat the degrees of freedom associated with each, with each patch or maybe each pair of patches as a set of one dimensional systems. And then you add up their separate contributions to entanglement. This is a heuristic, of course. And then you actually uh, recover the uh, Kirov and the um, uh, 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 Kirchhoff's formula. So it gives you a, uh, well, I mean, as I said, heuristic way to understand the, uh, uh, the GK formula. But the advantage of this understanding is that now you can ask if you turn on some uh, interactions whether this would remain robust or not. So turns out this patching and uh, uh, dividing the degree of freedom uh, uh, into individual patches is the starting point of the, I guess, old fashioned way now of bosonization of Fermi surface. So basically you bosonize the degree of freedom associated with each patches because they are modeled as uh, decoupled wires and you introduce bosonic fields uh, associated with them. Now, uh, you can turn on uh, Fermi liquid interactions, which are actually quadratic in these boson fields um, that actually is between different patches. So this, of course, is the old fashioned way of uh, doing bosonization. I read recently that Sans group has a, has a new way to do that, which I'm very eager to learn about actually uh, through this, uh, uh, through this uh, visit. So the advantage of this is that you have a quadratic boson theory, which you can diagonalize. And once you diagonalize it, well, it looks very much like the free fermions. But the problem, of course, is that uh, the diagonal degrees of freedom and the original degrees of freedom are actually not related to each other locally. So if you want to actually ask how the, uh, uh, the entanglement entropy changes, it's actually quite a, quite, a, quite a bit of a challenge. So because this is uh, not so closely related to the main results I'm going to report, uh, I, I'm just going to flash this that uh, we actually found a way to do that and through a, a, a sequence of procedures, we came to the conclusion that, uh, well, there are indeed corrections because of this non-local relation between the diagonal fields and the original fields, which of course we uh, understand uh, 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 is uh, uh, satisfies the GK formula, but uh, that uh, correction is only at the area law level but the coefficient of the logarithm is actually uh, not affected. So that's the, that's the main conclusion of this work, yeah. I'm wondering if this really comes from the artifact that you assume the patch theory is valid. Say, the picture that uh, the radial direction is still from 1D, 1 yeah. plus 1D CFT and with all that central charge. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so, so that's why I said that it's, it's, it's heuristic. But, but at least if you push this, you would say that, well, Fermi liquid interaction does not change this result. I mean, if you, if you go one step further from that. And as I said, there are now better ways to do bosonization, and I want to learn whether this can be improved using the new methods. Yeah. And I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, is there any, uh, uh, well, okay, so this is a violation of, of, of the law. So that sounds like a bad thing, but can we actually find some usage of it? Well, the answer turned out to be yes. So turns out there are, I guess, uh, uh, in particular, holographic ways to construct exotic phases of matter. But the microscopic description of those phases or states that you actually construct are not so easy to, to uh, not so easily accessible. So one of the easiest, if not the easiest, way to detect whether the state that you uh, that you um, have constructed has a Fermi surface or not, is to actually look at its entanglement property and ask if there's a lock. So, so that's at least qualitatively is a diagnostic of Fermi surfaces. So again, here we took one step further. It turns out you can actually even determine the shape of the Fermi surface by systematically change the way that you actually do the cut. So basically you can set up a 1D system along a particular direction and do a 1D cut. And the 1D cut will give you a log coefficient that is proportional to the projection of your Fermi surface, in this case, a three-dimensional Fermi surface onto that direction. So this is very, very similar to the uh, uh, experimental way of determining Fermi surface, shape of Fermi surface through uh, quantum oscillation. There, of course, you apply the direction of magnetic field, which plays a role very similar to the direction of the entanglement 
that I'm setting up, and that measures the extrema uh, uh, Fermi surface uh, area along that direction. So basically, this is like an entanglement way of doing quantum oscillation. So you can actually determine the Fermi surface shape. So very recently, um, Charlie Kane's group actually used, uh, I would say, a related idea to actually determine the Fermi surface topology uh, using this log. I mean, it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but as far as I can tell, uh, closely related. So basically, you have to divide your system very judiciously, and I think this is, this is a procedure that Mike is very, very familiar with. And if you uh, do the division correctly, and uh, uh, measure the mutual information, which of course is very closely related to entanglement entropy, in these, uh, uh, among these uh, divisions, uh, of course, most of the log violation will actually cancel, but there will be a residual log whose coefficient is actually determined by the Euler characteristics of the, of the Fermi surface. So the main message here is uh, these logs are actually useful uh, in determining both the Fermi surface uh, geometry and uh, even topology. Okay, so, um, uh, well, obviously, the, uh, the existence of the extended Fermi surfaces uh, is crucial for the area law violation uh, beyond one dimension. But what about bosonic systems? Well, bosons actually normally do very different things. They can go critical, but when they go critical, they don't actually go critical along a Fermi surface or extended surface in momentum states. Usually, they actually are soft only along, uh, around individual points in, in momentum space. And in those cases, you actually don't get a violation uh, uh, beyond one dimension. Now, there are, of course, bosonic systems that actually supports emergent Fermi surfaces. Uh, one example, this is just a, a, as a representative, uh, would be some uh, specific Fermi liquid states that has uh, spin down Fermi surfaces, there, you people have actually shown in the, through the matrix that you also have um, you also have a logarithmic violation of area law, but I would count that uh, as the same origin as the violation due to uh, existence of Fermi surface. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people, uh, uh, myself included, have actually proposed uh, 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 systems or models that actually has uh, extended. Uh, surfaces along which gapless bosonic excitations uh, 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 exist. And these are, well, uh, uh, I guess uh, due to a lack of uh, imagination, called both surfaces. And uh, there are concrete models uh, uh, um, that actually can be written down, which are basically free boson or free uh, harmonic oscillator models. And we showed that actually in the presence of such both surfaces, you also have uh, this uh, 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 this uh, error law uh, violation, which is actually logarithmic. Uh, I have actually uh, several slides uh, to, to, to actually demonstrate that, but uh, uh, due to lack of time, uh, I'm going to, not going to go through them, uh, but if people are interested and ask about it, I can actually pull them up. Okay, so, um, so a quick summary thus far. So um, entanglement entropy error law is uh, widely obeyed by ground states of local homotomies. Um, violations of, of the area law is actually uh, quite rare, above 1D. Uh, well, for the uh, uh, examples, which are the only known examples, certainly only known to me, uh, that, that I have presented, it requires either the presence of a Fermi surface or both surface. And uh, we have a reasonable understanding of them because they can be related uh, to the 1D a logarithmic uh, violation. So um, now the question or the challenge is what about highly excited states, which are the ones that are more uh, uh, related or more relevant to, uh, uh, to this uh, question that I posed at the very beginning of whether uh, ETH uh, uh, holds or not. So there, uh, the expectation is that, well, they should have volume law. And one obvious reason is that, well, if ETH were to hold, uh, the entanglement entropy should be the same as the thermal entropy, which obviously is extensive. Um, and the reason people they should uh, people believe they should have a uh, volume law entropy is because well, for highly excited states, there's really nothing special about them. You should view them just as some random states in Hilbert space. Now, to me, that's not so convincing because after all, these are still eigenstates of local homotonies. So, okay, so I, I wasn't convinced. Well, until what we did that I'm going to report, 
And before what we did, there was almost no explicit uh, results other than uh, limited numerics. So to address the origin of this uh, volume law uh, in chemical entropy for highly excited states, uh, we are going to actually go back to uh, free fermions, where I'm going to show that actually there is a duality. Uh, there are two related dualities. One is the duality between momentum and uh, and uh, uh, real space, and also there's a duality uh, between uh, ground state and excited states. So let's actually start from the uh, uh, momentum and position duality. So to actually uh, formulate an entanglement property, in, uh, entanglement problem for free fermions, you need to specify two boundaries. You first have to specify a state, which of course uh, is an occupation pattern in a uh, uh, momentum space. And then you have to do a uh, cut uh, or by partitioning in, uh, in real space. So that's my subsystem A and the uh, white uh, area is a uh, white region is a supplement. Well, this uh, uh, duality between momentum and position space is if you actually interchange these two uh, systems or these two uh, partitions, you actually get exactly the same entanglement spectrum. So let me explain uh, why that's, that is true. So the nice thing about free fermion is that, well, whether it's ground state or excited state, you always have the weak theory, which means the two-point function or the two-point correlation matrix determines everything, including the reduced density matrix. You can actually relate uh, the reduced density matrix to the uh, uh, two-point function uh, uh, this way, but the, uh, the, the, the important, well, the specific uh, uh, expression doesn't really matter, okay? So, um, well, so, so once you can actually set up some relation between the two-point functions, between the uh, exchanged systems, you can actually uh, find some uh, specific relation between the reduced density matrix and the entanglement entry. So the key point is that the state of the system, the, the state that you, are, uh, that you are actually working with, as I said, is a, a set of uh, occupation pattern. So that's a projection operator into the occupied states, okay? Now, when you calculate the two-point function, when you calculate the two-point function of a particular subsystem, all what you need to do is to project this occupation pattern into the real space. So if I copy the uh, occupation pattern in momentum space or the projection uh, into the uh, subsystem that you're interested in, the two-point uh, function matrix is just RPR, okay? Now, when you do this position and momentum exchange, the corresponding two-point function matrix is PRP. Now, the key point here is that P and R are both projection operators meaning that when you square it, you get the same thing. So therefore, you can start from a particular eigenstate of M, the original two-point uh, uh, correlation matrix. You can construct, actually, the uh, 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 eigenvector of the dual system by simply projecting it to, let me see. Uh, right, so because this is, uh, uh, this is already a uh, uh, projected to the to the uh, to the to the uh, to the subsystem already, you can actually show that this actually is the uh, is also an eigenstate of the RP, uh, PRP with exactly the same with exactly the same eigenvalue. So all we should need to uh, to do is to actually use uh, take advantage of the fact that these are uh, projection operators. Yeah. Um, are, are there some assumptions on what? The topology of the real space and the no. momentum space look no. like? But no. No, I mean, all that's needed here are that, uh, is the fact that these are projection operators. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. I see. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, immediately telling you that actually the two, the two uh, uh, correlation matrices will have the same spectrum. So this was the result obtained by uh, Juan and Arobas uh, uh, 10 years ago now. So this actually allows us to actually I establish a drop. Yeah, okay. That was the question. Yeah. This slide. Could you clarify what A is? A is a subsystem. So A, A is, A is uh, this area, uh, this uh, subsystem where you are actually uh, calculating the entanglement entropy. So you have, a, you have a, the first thing on the next slide is a projector onto the lattice sites in A? 
No. So, R oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so R is a projection in real space that projects in, into the region A. P is a projection operator projecting into your Fermi surface, uh, your Fermi C, if you wish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they are, they are both projection operators, even though they are projection operators in different, different spaces. So this allows us to actually establish a duality between ground states and excited states. So let's start from a very regular looking uh, occupation pattern with a nice looking for me C, which uh, probably can be uh, written as the ground state of some uh, local, nice local uh, free fermion homotony. But now I do a highly, highly unusual division. So my uh, subsystem A is actually a collection of these origin dots, which of course and can be arbitrary shaped. Here I made them looking more regular than it needs to be. Okay, so they are very, very fragmented. So now you ask, when I do this kind of division, what kind of entanglement entropy should I get? Well, this is a ground state, so I should get area. But because my division is highly uh, fragmented, the area actually scales with the volume. So it turns out the area law gives you a volume law entanglement entropy scale. Okay? So now I apply this duality of switching exchange between momentum and the real space. Now I have a very good, nice looking uh, subsystem in real space, which is what people normally would do when they study entanglement. But now look at the corresponding occupation pattern in momentum space. That's highly, highly irregular. And that corresponds to a highly excited state. So you find that I can actually now, using the result I've turned here, to tell how the entanglement entropy would scale for a regular way of doing this division, but for a highly excited state. And, I, and I, as I already argued, that should scale as well. So this actually tells you that the area law of the graph state and the volume law of highly excited states are really two sides of the same coin, at least for these uh, free fermion systems. Okay. Sorry. So yeah, was there a question? Yeah. Um, so you also have to swap who is who, right? So it's the in the top picture, it's yeah. it's the area scales like the volume in position space. Yeah. In the second one, it's the area scales like the volume in momentum space. Okay. So, so if so, we're asking about how it depends on the area and position space, that's a different question. That's how things scale with the area bounding your Fermi surface and momentum space in the first picture. Okay. So, um, so they are actually the same. So it turns out uh, the density of the states that you have in momentum space also scales with, scales with the volume of real space, right? Because if you have a finite system size, your, your, your momentum, it's actually related to the next slide, but, but the, the, the point is that the density of the, density of the, uh, the, the, the momentum points, that's actually consistent with our system size, scales with the, with the volume. I mean, fundamentally, the number of degrees of freedom is the same in momentum space and real space. Mm -hmm. So they must have, therefore, the same, uh, same scaling behavior. But, but, but I think that point will be made clearer uh, uh, when, when we actually go through the, okay. the, 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 the next set of slides, which actually we're going to try to establish an even stronger result than this. So, uh, so this, of course, uh, is an argument that for typical highly excited states, the entanglement entropy should scale at the volume. But it does not yet tell you whether this volume law scaling is the same as thermal entropy or not. Okay, so the thermal entropy, of course, has to scale at the volume, but having a volume law scaling, that's a, a, that's a, a, a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition to, uh, to, um, to uh, establish the, the, the entanglement entropy being the same as thermal entropy. And actually, strictly speaking, if you want to establish ETH, you need to actually prove that not only the entanglement entropy, but the entire reduced density matrix should take the same form as the thermal density matrix. And that's exactly what we are trying to establish for typical uh, highly excited states. So again, the key point is that because of the presence of um, 
presence of a weak theorem, all what you need to prove is the two-point function or two-point matrix is so. So let's see uh, 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 how can we actually do that. So let's actually calculate the two-point uh, correlation matrix, but restricting very importantly to your subsystem A. Okay. So how would you do that? Well, if you open up Kardanov's uh, uh, Stadmac uh, textbook, you will find that okay. Well, it's good to go to uh, momentum space because the occupation number is a. Uh, well defined in momentum space. So the usual next step when you actually assign a homework problem to a Stadmac uh, students is you turn this summation to an integral. Okay, but of course there is a condition. In order to actually turn the summation into an integral, the term that's being summed over has to be a smooth function of momentum. But that's not the case because here the occupation is jumping between zero and one randomly. It's not a smooth function of k, so you are stuck. You cannot turn the summation into integral, and uh, I don't know how to actually uh, do any calculation without doing that. So now let's actually try to uh, divide and conquer. Let's not try to do the summation in one shot, but let me divide that into two steps. So let's actually first divide the momentum space into some cells, okay? Let's try to do the cell summation first, and then sum over uh, from cell to another. So the hope is that, well, if you have enough points in one cell, when you do the cell summation, it will give you some average of this n, and hopefully this average will become smooth, even though the individual occupation number is not smooth. Okay, so that's the hope. Okay, so we sort of blur our vision uh, so that each cell looks like one big chunk and then uh, something smooth. But there's a problem. The problem is that this uh, occupation is not the only thing that you're being summed over, because you still have this phase factor. And if you actually treat all the points within each cell equally, you're messing up the phase factor, which is very. So here, that's why restricting to a small subsystem uh, matters. Because if you restrict this J and L, to be within the same sufficiently small subsystem, you can hope to find a cell size that this phase factor varies very little within each cell. So basically, you need to actually choose your cell size so that you can do this average within each cell without messing up this factor. And this is always possible in the limit that I'm considering, which is that the small subsystem size is much, much smaller than the total system size. Of course, this of course works for the typical excited states with this kind of occupation pattern, but there will be in free fermion some atypical uh, uh, patterns where the occupied and occupied states somehow segregate, and no matter how you do this cause graining, you're still not going to get anything smooth. So uh, the basic idea is already here, so to be a little bit more quantitative, you need to ch choose the si cell size that is big associated with the system size, which, as I mentioned, gives the density of the allowed k points in momentum space, but it has to be small compared to that associated with the subsystem size, okay? So that you don't mess up the surface factor. And with that choice, which, uh, as I uh, uh, argued, is that is always possible in the limit that I'm considering, I can do the cell summation first to get something that is smooth, and then do the summation over the cells, which I can do my usual, uh, the way that I usually do with my uh, Stadmac homework, which is to turn the, uh, uh, turn the uh, uh, summation into an integral, okay? So, so now the, 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 the expectation is that once you have done this uh, course graining and you have done this uh, summation within each cell, as long as you have enough points in the, in the, uh, within each cell, what you get out of that oil average should approach the most probable average. And what is that most probable average? Well, that obviously depends on which state that I'm, I'm working with. So you need to tell me something about the state. Well, usually you specify the conservation, conservative quantities, one is the particle number, and the other is total energy. 
So this gives you two Lagrangian multipliers when you optimize the probability. And not surprisingly, what you find is the Fermi direct distribution. So the claim is that once you have done the cell average, you actually recover the Fermi direct distribution, even though you really only started with a single eigenstate where the distribution is either zero or one. And then you can actually do your usual, usual uh, 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 exercise and find that the two point function for such typical state is nothing but the free fermion thermal two point function. Okay? And again, because two point function determines everything, you can claim victory, namely uh, the entire reduced density matrix is so. On the other hand, on the other hand, there are such atypical states which does not fall into this category. This cross graining trick does not get you out of this uh, uh, segregated pattern, and this does not work. So, so we have a weak version of uh, eigenstate thermalization, meaning that the overwhelming majority of the eigenstates indeed have a reduced density matrix that is thermal, but they are highly quantifiable and visible, actually, visually at least, uh, 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 outliers that actually uh, do not fall into this category, and we gave, uh, gave a, a name to this kind of behavior, uh, eigenstate, eigenstate typicality, uh, I, I guess borrowing uh, a term that people used uh, for canonical uh, typicality. Okay, so, um, well, just to mention in passing, so uh, so turns out uh, this behavior is related to a, a, a pretty old uh, math, math problem that apparently got uh, uh, solved uh, relatively recently. So basically, this is an integer partitioning problem. So using a 1D example, so you fix the particle number and you fix the total energy, you need to divide, you need to put these particles at different energy levels so that it comes up with the right total energy. And you can view each occupied state as a skyscraper, okay? So mathematics for reasons that I uh, don't fully understand, uh, is interested in the so-called limiting shape of, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of these uh, skyscrapers. And uh, I, I'm sure in the math context, it's a more general problem, uh, which apparently uh, was solved uh, uh, only 20 some years ago. And turns out, uh, one of my collaborators found that uh, this uh, so-called Wershik uh, 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 limiting curve is precisely uh, the uh, Fermi Dirac distribution uh, 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 when you uh, 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 interpret that um, uh, in this uh, context. Okay, so, um, but still, uh, 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 we only sort of, at this point, only have a visual understanding of the distinction between the typical uh, highly excited states and the atypical ones. Uh, we expect, I guess, essentially from the uh, central limit theorem that uh, when you go to sufficient large system size, uh, the, uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of the highly excited states should be typical. But can you actually uh, quantify uh, how typical is typical, or perhaps more importantly, how many atypical states you have? So, so it turns out uh, there is a, a, another mathematical tool, which I think is most familiar to computer scientists, known as a Kolmogorov complexity, which, uh, which uh, uh, is very, very useful to us. And actually, there is another uh, uh, um, thing that's nice about this, is, which is, as I said, we start with a uh, pure state, right? Which, of course, has no entropy. But to reveal its entropy, somehow we have to divide the system and look at the reduced density matrix of the system. And then we find there's entropy. On the other hand, the entropy uh, should be an intrinsic property of the, uh, of the system. So we argue that actually, at least for free fermions, this chromograph complexity can be viewed as a, a, a intrinsic entropy. And our argument for that is we are going to uh, show that it has the same scaling property as entangled entropy. Okay, so what is it? So let's, oh, yeah. Just a question. So in a field theory, I yeah. would say that the ground state has a lot of entanglement. Yes. Not little entanglement. Yes. But you you would say that the ground state's less so, so So, so it's an it's a, it's a, um, order of limit issue, right? 
So if you take your cutoff to zero first, obviously your entanglement entropy diverges. But what I do is I, in condensed matter, we have a natural cutoff. We are fixing the cutoff, but we take the thermodynamic limit. So in that, in my way of doing things, what matters is, is the scaling with respect to volume. Okay. You are, yours is scaling with respect to cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so coming back to the simplest possible case, which is the one dimensional case. So the trivial, completely trivial observation is that the fermion occupation pattern is nothing but a binary string, right? So it's zero or one. So the Brown state uh, occupation pattern is a single string, right? You have a bunch of zeros, you hit your first Fermi points and a bunch of ones, then you end and they get zeros. Uh, uh, that's, that's all what, it, what there is. So they are simple, but typical uh, uh, excited states are actually a more random, um, more random uh, 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 pattern. So the ground state like uh, occupation pattern is very easy to describe in words, but most typical strings are random and more complex. So power graph complexity is actually a quantitative way to, uh, to quantify this complexity. So basically, that is a measure of how compressible or how incompressible your binary string is. So when you have, let's say, a very complicated file like your thesis, well, you find that's very compressible. Okay, you like that, right? What that means is that your thesis contains very little information, right? The compressible strings contains less information. But if you actually, I don't know, use your, use your, your pad to type something, that's totally random. And you find that it's incompressible, right? So this uh, color graph complexity is precisely a measure of the incompressible amount of information that's, that's contained. So the ground state configuration is highly compressible because all what you need to do is to specify two locations. And you only need two logs that add up, okay? But for typical highly excited state, it's incompressible and uh, it scales uh, with the system size. So that already is the same scaling behavior in 1D that we discussed in the very beginning. Okay, so they have the same scaling. Um, on the other hand, uh, we do, as uh, we already uh, sort of knew and expect, that you have these uh, highly excited states whose patterns are still simple, but, uh, but they are rare. So now you can ask, now you can ask uh, how many uh, such strings you have. Well, all what you need to do is ask how big your string is after compression, because that's the total, that's the minimum amount of uh, 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 bits you have to have to characterize these states. And of course, number of states is just two to the, to the power of the, of the compressed version. Okay, so you find that if you define your atypical states to be those that have sub-volume uh, 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 entanglement entropy or sub-volume com uh, graph complexity, Kc, then that's that's that. So obviously, it's exponentially suppressed compared to typical states. So, um, well, you can easily generalize this to higher dimensions. Again, for a, a, a ground state configuration, well, in this case, I have a square-shaped Fermi surface. You can do it in a poor, poor man's way. Of course, this is still 0, 1, 0, 1, but because it's in higher dimension in 2D, in this particular case, it's not a one-dimensional array anymore. So what you can do is you manually turn this into a one-dimensional array so it goes through the rows, let's say, one by one. And then you find that you actually have a log from each, let's say, a, a, a row that has an intersection with the Fermi surface. So that immediately already gives you this uh, log enhancement. But there is actually a more elegant way uh, to do this, which is you don't try to convert this to a 1D array, but you view this as a graph. So it turns out there is a well-defined uh, uh, object called the complexity of a graph. And uh, it turns out there are some very recent results, which is immediately useful to us, uh, which says that, well, for this kind of graph, like this one, there is a log uh, enhancement to the area. But again, as usual, for the uh, typical uh, highly excited states, uh, it's essentially irreducible, and uh, the KC scales as a number of uh, points, which is a, a, which is a volume loss scale. Okay. Okay, so um, well, finally, uh, I guess timing seems to be pretty good. 
That's actually internal interaction. So we, we have these outliers. We, we know what they look like. We can even quantify their abundance uh, with the help of KC, et cetera, et cetera. But finally, let's actually turn on interaction and ask what happens. Well, the intuition is that when you turn on, let's say, weak interaction, which turns out to be the limit where, where, where things can be uh, uh, done more, uh, in a more controlled way, you are going to mix up the uh, free fermion states that are very close in energy. And when you do the mixing, you are going to mix up the most abundant typical states with those rare states. And hopefully, well, seems very likely, and we are going to show it is indeed the case, that will actually eliminate these atypical states because they will be mixed with the typical ones, which are the dominant ones. So quantitatively, what you can do is the following. So you start with a free fermion Hamiltonian, and of course you have a, a, a many body density of states uh, with, uh, with, let's say, a, a, this bell-like shape. Now, you turn on some interaction, and once you turn on some interaction, these original free fermion states are no longer exact eigenstates. And they have an energy variation that, not surprisingly, is proportional to the strength of the interaction. So it has a spreading in energy, which scales as the ratio between the interaction strength and the bandwidth. Okay? Now, a lot of ETH-related literature uh, 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 results to the, uh, to the uh, random matrix theory kind of argument. But obviously, uh, the homotonia is not a random matrix. Okay? However, uh, in the nuclear physics literature, it's actually pretty well established that there is a, a variation of the random matrix theory known as embedded random matrix theory, which states the following. That is, well, if you turn on interaction and you mix up states within an energy window, you can apply the uh, random matrix theory to states within that energy window, which is the variation of your basis states. Okay? And the main ingredient of that is the interacting eigenstates can be viewed as a random superposition of states, not in the entire Hilbert space, but within this energy window. So what we are trying to do now is to actually take this result and ask for such a random superposition, which the uh, interacting eigenstates should look like, what is the probability of finding an atypical state or a scar state, which we define as a state that has a sub-volume law entanglement. Okay. So, well, okay, so it turns out there are, again, uh, some uh, 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 existing mathematical results that we can basically just combine and actually, at the end of the day, obtain a pretty strong final result. So let's start from a microcanonical ensemble, which is a uh, density matrix that is just an equal probability uh, superposition, uh, well, it's actually incoherent superposition of all the states in, the, in this energy window, okay? So the number of states in this energy window is a small fraction of the entire Hilbert space, but they have the same scaling behavior. So it's a huge number of states, okay? It scales uh, 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 exponentially with the total system size. So Navis lemma uh, provides a bound to the trace distance between the reduced density matrix of a random, let, let me finish this, uh, the sentence and we'll it, it provides a bound uh, of the trace distance between the uh, reduced density matrix of a, a random state that's constructed in that Hilbert subspace and this uh, uh, microcanonical ensemble, yeah. Um, so your definition of uh, a typical state via the Kolgomorov complexity that includes both area law and log? So, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anything that scales less than the volume law, I would call a typical state or a scar state. Okay. So that, that's a definition. I mean, again, it's not universal, but I think it's uh, the most, uh, most uh, 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 used definition of a scar state. But our result can be modified very easily if you want to change that definition. And maybe you can tell me how you want to change that definition, and I'm going to tell you how I'm going to change my bound. Okay, so this provides a uh, provides a, 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 a bound to the tr uh, trace distance. So it turns out this last term is actually totally negligible because, as I said, uh, m prime grows as the size of total Hilbert space, but m a is the size of the 
subhuman space. So I can actually neglect that. So then you can use another inequality that my postdoc uh, Kemal found uh, to use this trace distance to bound the entropy difference between that of the uh, reduced, uh, uh, that of the uh, uh, microcanonical ensemble and a random state in the uh, in the uh, in the in the Hilbert subspace, and uh, again using the uh, 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 convexity of the entropy, uh, this uh, 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 this uh, um, this uh, uh, entropy from the uh, microcanonical ensemble can be bound to the uh, typical entropy of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of these uh, uh, basic states, which are these free fermion states, we, which we understand very well. So by combining all of these, you find that uh, you can bond uh, the deviation of a random uh, state in this uh, Hilbert, Hilbert subspace uh, from that of the thermal uh, entropy. So the, the, the conclusion that this uh, deviation, the probability of finding a deviation that actually goes as uh, that actually has a, a, a coefficient for the for the volume law term uh, grows uh, actually is suppressed uh, super super exponentially with the uh, difference so um, the uh, uh, using the, the the definition that I just uh, uh, just alluded to you find that uh, the probability of finding using our definition of the scar state or atypical state uh, goes to zero super uh, exponentially, and the uh, uh, expectation value of a scar state goes to zero extremely fast. So if you want to uh, uh, modify the definition, all what I need to do is to modify this coefficient. Remember here, the coefficient is that of the thermal entropy. Yeah. Can you say again what kappa and m prime are? So kappa is the uh, volume law uh, entropy coefficient that corresponds to the thermal entropy. Yeah, and what, what what was the other? And what is m prime? M prime is uh, m prime is uh, is the uh, Hilbert space size of this energy window, where I'm applying the random matrix theory to. But the key point is that it has the same scaling as a total a total Hilbert space size. So when you say that the probability of finding a scar state goes exponentially to zero, you mean as you increase the size of your energy window? No. So yeah, yeah. when I say I go to zero, I mean it as I increase the system size. So the energy window is fixed in energy space, but the number of states I see. grows exponentially with the system size. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, it looks like I'm right on time. So, uh, so the conclusion is that for generic interacting Hamiltonian, which allows you to use the random matrix theory uh, in the way that I did, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, probability of finding a scar state goes to zero extremely fast with system size. So obviously, I mean, everything that I talked about um, has a lot to do with entanglement, and the entanglement is a di diagnostic with a lot of things. So let me end with a quote. Um, yeah, so, so, okay, so I have this bond, okay, yeah. So let me end with a quote by Charles Bennett, who didn't get this year's Nobel Prize, but he shared this year's uh, uh, fundamental prize, uh, breakthrough prize, uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental physics, which uh, described the entanglement in an extremely positive way. He says that a classical house is at least as dirty as its dirtiest room, okay? <laughs> Talking about entanglement entropy, obviously, referring to that. But a quantum house can be dirty in every room, yet still perfectly clean overall. Okay, so the quantum world is much cleaner and nice. Um, I'm a <laughs> not a particularly positive person, so I'm going to actually uh, uh, say something to that effect, but from a uh, negative uh, aspect, especially in this election season, I guess. <laughs> so, so if your life is a mess and it has high entropy, don't blame the society, okay? Which may well be in a pure and a steady state. Of course, the, the, the eigenstate is a steady state. Instead, it's probably because you're entangled with someone who is having an equally messy life. <laughs> I think this applies, uh, especially after, after tomorrow's election results <laughs> is announced. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, 
uh, can, can you use this sort of uh, coarse graining and momentum space picture to quantify at what energy scale ETH kicks in? Like, when do you go from area law logarithmic to volume law? Right. So, so the excitation energy has to be extensive, means that you have to have a finite excitation energy density. So that, that's sort of the hard boundary between one state-like behavior right. and uh, 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 excited or thermal state behavior. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And it, yeah. is that something in this case that would be specific to free fermions, or would that generalize? Well, I mean, free? the only concrete results are, of course, about free fermions, right. and we know exactly what to do with them. And you start to see that, right? I mean, if you have a excited a, 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 a Ground state like configuration is either zero or one with a fixed boundary, and the cross graining doesn't get you anywhere. Right. And you start to increase energy, then the Fermi surface becomes blur, and then there's the energy uh, a range where you go from almost exactly one, almost exact zero. So that's the range you have to do your cross graining. But with the interaction, I mean, we made some very limited progress, yeah. but I would love to see this kind of uh, yeah. tricks, if you wish extended to interacting states. Uh, what, one thing I'm wondering is, is there some kind of, because this coarse grading picture sounds a lot like block spin. Um, yeah. Which of course cut off started. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is there some analog of like some critical state where the, the, this sort of transition happens from? Yeah, you're thinking about some RG-like picture. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. So obviously here, the how much coarse graining you can do right. is actually not constrained by criticality or, or length scale, but actually by the size of the subsystem. Ah, uh, oh, and that you want to be. Yeah. Much so, more. so the smaller the subsystem you have, the more cost graining you're allowed. Right. Now, people have argued that actually this kind of behavior should apply even when you do a half half division, as long as one is slightly smaller than the other. Some more behavior should kick in, but but I can't do cost graining that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What? So I, I guess you were saying I'm trying to understand. So I think of a free fermion system as very integrable, uh, maybe yeah. a prototypical integrable system. Yes. And you say that um, it looked it looks like it displays ETH for, for most of the states. For most states. So is yeah. there any yeah, so what um, if I just look at our typical state? There's no way I would see, I see no violation of ETH. I, I, how, well, how would I distinguish this from a true, a true, um, I don't know, interacting non integrable system if I just look at a single state? So I guess I, I would actually, I actually, I can actually answer your question from the opposite side, which is, well, if you look at this kind of state, you would say, well, it's a similar state, just like any generic system. But I know how to construct the outlier, which is right here. They are simpler to construct, but apparently, well, assuming ETH actually holds generically, for well, non-integrable system, the equivalence of this doesn't exist. And the last part of the talk is sort of trying to answer how, this, how these states disappear. That's because they get mixed with those states by interaction. So that's how they disappear. So, so the way that I look at, look at this, this is basically the right picture for your thermal states. But you have to kill these guys. And the interaction seems to do that for you. In a well-defined way. Yeah, um, is there a way to understand how these kinds of arguments can be used to study like scars and interacting systems? So, yeah. So, um, so I, again, I'll give you a slightly roundabout way to answer this. So our argument, of course, is founded on this. So we assume, for good reasons, of course, we can use random matrix theory in this energy window. And that's how you actually model or describe a generic interacting ground state, well, a, a generic uh, uh, interacting eigenstate. But the models that people have found that have been discussing that support these scar states obviously has a subspace 
of excited states that don't have this kind of description. So, okay, so the literature is growing very fast. This is a fast moving uh, uh, object. There are actually multiple papers since ours was posted that I haven't really followed closely. So apparently one, uh, actually, essentially all of the uh, known examples have this so-called Krylov subalgebra that actually spans a Hilbert subspace that seem to be decoupled from the rest of these states. So this kind of description seems to be inapplicable to that subspace of states. Now, of course, I mean, the problem with this is that, well, once you have found it, you say, ah, these are special. But before you find it, you don't know whether this description actually works for all of the excited states or uh, that's not really the case. By that description, you mean like um, adding the interaction would make that energy region described by random No, 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 no. So, so it's just totally different thing. So, so you start with the interacting Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian has some kind of a special algebra which spans a, 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 a Hilbert subspace that's decoupled on the rest. So then there's no mixture between that subspace and the rest of the other states. So this assumes that everything is mixed essentially equally within the energy window. And the eigenstates can be written in this, in this way, which is a random superposition. But in the models that I, I'm aware of, I'm not particularly well informed as a matter of fact, uh, there seems to be cases, well, there seems to be the case uh, 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 always true that to have scar states, there must be some states that actually escape this kind of description. Yeah, but, but this uh, understanding of scar states uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, actually growing <laughs> with time and hope, uh, probably still far from, from uh, 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 complete. But, but what we have done here is basically saying, okay, assuming the random matrix theory applies, which should be the generic case, you shouldn't have scar states. So therefore, the existence of scar states tells you there's something special about your model that has those states. So that, that's my interpretation, if you wish. Yeah. Sorry, just one more. So is, isn't there, I, I don't remember the details of ETH, but isn't there sort of a stronger version of ETH that also describes matrix elements between different states at the same energy? And, and if you look at the stronger version of ETH, yeah. you, you see violations that have nothing to do with your eight. Even right. if you look at your so-called typical states, maybe you would see. Yeah, so, so, so this uh, uh, is related to my disclaimer at the very beginning. There are different versions of ETH, or different definitions of ETH. Mm -hmm. so, so, so my definition of ETH that I use in this talk is exclusively about, about the, 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 the reduced density matrix. Of, uh, of the of the um, of a small subsystem. So um, what you are referring to, which uh, uh, has uh, uh, I mean focuses on observables. Um, yeah. So so my sort of uh, difficulty, if you wish, with that is uh, you need to define what an observable is in in that version of a uh, 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 definition of ETH. So yeah, I'm not, I, I don't have much to say uh, about that. Now, as I said at the very beginning, if the version of definition of ETH that I use is valid, one prerequisite is that the reduced, the, the entanglement entropy has to be, well, first of all, it has to satisfy volume law. And secondly, a stronger requirement is it has to be the same as the thermal entropy. So, so I'm looking for violation of that criteria. Any other questions? No, let's thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, I guess where my question is coming from is like clearly it's a free thermal system, so it doesn't thermalize, it doesn't uh, equilibrate, right? And so exactly. there's some version of ETH that's probably strong enough maybe to guarantee. Exactly. 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 So of course.